Hi guys, it's Mrs. Schacht here, and I'm here to talk about urbanization or the rise of cities in America. Um, prior to the Civil War, most cities were centers of commerce or finance. But after the Civil War, they also became centers of industrialization. And industrialization, while it brought jobs, it also brought lots of people and unfortunately lots of problems um, as these cities continued to grow in the late 1800s. So the first thing I'd like to address is the rise of what we refer to as streetcar cities. Um, one of the cool elements of all of this new technology that's taking shape is that transportation is going to improve greatly. And you're going to see the rise of electric trolleys in America's major cities. However, as you can see here from the trolleys on the street, most of these electric trolleys did cause some congestion as well as multiple accidents. So cities like New York experimented with elevating the trains. Um, they were the first to do so in 1871. As you guys know, Chicago has an elevated train system as well. And then Boston in 1897 actually started putting their trains, also known as subways, underneath the ground. What this did is while it gave um, people within city limits transportation, it did cause many wealthier residents to move out of the city um, and away from the city center and begin to create suburbs. So we also see the rise of suburbia as well. We did talk about the mass production of steel and the rise of skyscrapers, but that is another element to urbanization during this time period. The very first skyscraper actually was built in Chicago in 1885. It's this one right here, the Home Insurance Building, um, built and designed, I should say, by William LeBaron Jenny. And this was at the corner of Adams and LaSalle, and while it's no longer standing today, you will still see buildings of this style in Chicago. And this becomes known as the Chicago style of architecture um, with the three pane windows, um, buildings that are about 10 to 12 stories high. Yes, those were actually called skyscrapers at the time, um, as well as what we call this kind of like beige terracotta decoration outside. So next time you're downtown, um, look closely at some of the buildings in the loop. Additionally, we have um, a second wave of immigration coming into major cities, and you're going to hear more about those immigrants in another video. But many of these new immigrants are coming through a place called Ellis Island in New York City to be processed. And they're also coming from Southern and Eastern Europe, and they're looking for jobs. And so one of the things we start to see are the rise of ethnic neighborhoods. And what that means is if I'm an Italian immigrant and I move to New York, I want to move near other Italian immigrants because they speak the same language as I do. Perhaps they hold the same customs and traditions as I do. And then maybe they can help me out by finding me a place to live and a job. And so there's still evidence today, which I think is really cool, of these ethnic neighborhoods. Um, if you go to New York, there's a very large, thriving Little Italy. There's a Chinatown. Go to Boston. You see, you know, so much evidence of Irish immigration. Even if you just go to Chicago, you've got, you know, a Polish community. Um, you've got a Chinatown. You have a Little Italy. I mean, you still see a Greek town. You still see evidence of all these ethnic enclaves everywhere you go. And actually this chart on the right is um, right near the University of Illinois at Chicago. That was a place where a lot of immigrants settled. And I wanna say the blue that you see here are all Italian immigrants. Um, but yes, very common for immigrants to settle with one another. Um, and also they would form um, something called mutual aid societies where sometimes they would pay monthly dues. And then those um, dues would go toward helping other immigrants and helping them pay for funeral costs, um, helping them pay for one another if they lost a job or were injured on the job. And um, again, it was just another level of support. Now, where did the immigrants live? Well, unfortunately, they couldn't afford much. And so they lived in very cheap apartments known as dumbbell tenements. Now, of course, they're called dumbbells for the dumbbell shape of the layout, as you guys can see here. 
Typically, uh, if you follow my cursor, one, two, three, these three rooms together would be one apartment. Um, there would be a bedroom, kind of a kitchen area, and then another sitting room that would probably contain more beds. Um, and then of course, a fire escape. The very early tenements were about five to six stories high. Um, they did not contain electricity or plumbing. And one building could house as many as 20 families. As you can imagine, um, there's a lot of disease in the tenements. Um, they're pretty run down. They're, they're dirty. And if um, since there's no indoor plumbing, um, these would be the outhouses that one would have to use. Usually there was one outhouse for one building. So again, imagine, you know, sharing a bathroom with about 100 people or having to go outside in the dead of winter um, to use this. This would be the interior. As you can see, um, it looks pretty run down. Not every, at first, not every building was required to have a window. So there wasn't a lot of natural lighting. Um, and unfortunately, dumbbell tenements um, won't be fixed, if you will, or improved upon for the next couple of years. But here's my plug, because I didn't include any vacation photos. If you are in New York City, you can go to the Lower East Side, and there is a tenement museum. It really is phenomenal. You can actually visit the tenements. You can see the outhouses. The buildings themselves have been brought up to code, but... Um, it's very cool to see what an immigrant's experience would have been like, so I highly recommend it. And of course, when immigrants are living and working in the major cities, who's looking out for them? Well, um, political machines oftentimes were looking out, and I use that term loosely, for immigrants, and I'll explain why in a moment. But a political machine is essentially a group of politicians that expect support from its patrons um, in, form, in the form of votes. And in turn, they would provide social services um, or any sort of jobs or you know things that the neighborhoods needed. So again, a political machine basically gives jobs in exchange for votes. And while that's phenomenal, um, unfortunately, if you are caught up with a political machine, you're essentially like beholden to that machine um, for quite some time. So the very first, I shouldn't say very first, um, one of the most famous political machines was Tammany Hall in New York City. And this gentleman here is William Boss Tweed. And he was the longtime leader of Tammany Hall in New York. And this is what he really looks like. But um, most of the time when you see him in political cartoons, he's got like a diamond brooch on. He's um, a heavier set man, and he usually has like a money bag in place of his head. And so many political cartoons with this depiction were created by Thomas Nast. And believe it or not, when he was arrested and he escaped jail years later, people over in Europe actually recognized Boss Tweed from these political cartoons. But he essentially was known for um, extorting money from immigrants and from um, the city of New York. So what he would do is he would try to raise money to build, let's say, a courthouse, which he did, or you know, several other building projects. And he would charge um, the construction companies crazy amounts of money. Um, and he would, you know, take the money for the project and then take the rest of the money for himself. At his height, um, he basically controlled 65% of the public building funds in New York City. He was the third largest landowner in New York City. He served as the director of the Erie Railroad Company. Um, he was the director of several banks, and he even had a law service. Um, even though I'm pretty sure he did not have a law degree, he offered legal advice for very high prices. So among all of these things, he's making lots of money. He's overcharging um, people in his law practice. You know, he's moderating, you know, buildings being built, and he's charging the city of New York, you know, triple what it should cost and then walking away with those profits. Um, so like I said, he was arrested, he escaped jail, and then he was arrested again, and he died in jail of pneumonia um, years later. So folks, 
I hope that helps. Again, that is urbanization. Lots of great things happening during this time in terms of technology. But of course, there are still a lot of issues underneath the surface, hence the name The Gilded Age. Hope that helps and hope you have a great day.